So today your hosts are myself. Um, my name is Adam Lerner and I am the, a climate guide and lead, lead on our sustainable assessments team at Solvable. I'm joined by my colleague, May Bartlett, who is the head of our coaching practice and she's gonna be running the back end of Zoom for us as well as managing the chat, annotating some of our conversations. And we are also honored to be joined by Sophie Rifkin, who is the Director of Corporate Research and Engagement at the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business, where she oversees the return on sustainable investment, which they call ROSI methodology research with research partnerships with companies. Sophie is also an adjunct professor at NYU Stern, teaching coursework in sustainable strategy. She has over 14 years of experience working with organizations to grow and implement sustainability programs. We want to uh, first start off and say that this this we see these conversations as a community space. So we would like to invite you to use the chat to share questions and thoughts with others as we go. We hold three intentions for all of these new works conversations in the series. The first is to strengthen connections. So we're hoping that you build bonds and relationships with others that you don't know. Maybe you're reconnecting with others that you do even in the chat right now, that we're building new connections and strengthening existing ones in the sustainability community. The second is to shift perspectives. So we're trying to bring in new perspectives that shift our own way of thinking about sustainability. And the third is to champion important works of others, such as Sophie's work at uh, NYU Stern. I would like to uh, reintroduce Sophie and give Sophie Rifkin a chance before we start with questions, which we've developed in advance of this conversation, to share a little bit about her background and her work at Stern. Thank you so much, Adam and May, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining today. Um, I see some familiar names and faces, so hi to those um, from the NYU Stern student or graduate uh, community, and thanks to everyone else for um, being here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation, to your thoughts and feedback on what we're building and working on at Stern. Um, so uh, I work at the NYU Stern School of Business in our Center for Sustainable Business, and we are a five-year-old center within the business school founded by Tanzi Whalen, who ran Rainforest Alliance prior to joining Stern. We work throughout the entire school, undergrad, graduate, executive programs to really embed sustainability into the curriculum, into the career development programming, into our thought leadership work, and into our research agenda as well. We're, we very much believe that all current and future business leaders need to understand how to manage in an increasingly resource constrained and globally complex world and that you can bring a sustainability mindset to any role, function, industry, sector that you're joining. Um, so that's very much our sort of theory of change is to um, not necessarily just graduate students who want to go into a sustainability job, although we certainly prepare students for that as well, but to also prepare that next generation of CFOs, CMOs, CEOs, um, boards of directors as well, who can lead and think with a sustainability mindset. Um, the bulk of my work these days at CERN is really leading our engagement with companies on the return on sustainability investment methodology that we've developed at the center. ROSI, as we refer to it, is really a tool that we think helps to bridge the gap between sustainability investments and performance on the corporate side and how they drive financial performance, which is both a way for corporates to make better decision making about capital allocations or where to really invest or prioritize new projects as well as for investors to be able to not only just understand how a company's performing on ESG criteria, but to understand how that performance is driving the uh, is driving key financial performance as well, because that's the language of business. Um, and so how do we translate and take, you know, often thought of as more intangible or squishy types of outcomes related to sustainability and to translate them into more quantitative measures um, that can really help to advance um, the sort of sophistication and rigor that we all know sustainability work deserves. So I'll uh, 
stop there, Adam, and uh, lots more to discuss, I'm sure. That's great. Yeah. So let's start in with the first question, which I think builds off of the work that you're doing in terms of both the audience and cultivating the future leaders, but also working with those leaders. We talked in our conversation in advance of today about the uh, the the challenges in terms of companies making both the initial commitments to large scale sustainability programs or maintaining enduring commitments to those programs. And I'm curious from your perspective, and you talked about it, I think within the Center for Sustainable Business as kind of a white space. Do you see that the white space is, the, is really being able to make a more effective business case for sustainability and that there's still a lot of work to be done there? Or do you see primarily that the business case is already established and leaders need it, but what is really needed is a better set or more robust set of quantitative measures in order to be able to actually understand the return that you're talking about. Yeah. So I think firstly, I'll just say as a kind of disclaimer, even though we'll be talking about ROI and making a business case a lot today, um, we at the center, you know, don't believe that everything needs to have a business case, right? I think it's more a recognition that if sustainability efforts, and I'll, I use a very broad definition of what that, um, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, and I would say sustainability inclusive of environment, social, human rights, diversity work um, is, is that I, I think that, um, if those efforts are continually just viewed as the right thing to do or a nice to have, um, then we're really devaluing the mission critical role that investing in many different sustainability practices and strategies are driving in terms of business outcomes and financial performance, let alone the externalities. You know, Rosie's really around measuring internalities. Um, so, but, you know, so I, I think that, so just to kind of have a disclaimer there, um, but I, I think that I, what, what we see is that I think that the business case is there, but companies don't always know what it is. So I think it is more the latter, Adam, that it's really figuring out ways to translate the really um, powerful and aggressive uh, you know, for the most part, sustainability goals and commitments that all major companies have kind of at this point set. Um, and to actually figure out now the rub is really kind of figuring out how do you actually achieve those? And some of those things may not have a straightforward ROI and companies may pursue them anyway. But some of them, you know, maybe there's a lot more holistic value to be unlocked if you apply a rosy type of lens. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a cereal manufacturer operating in a water stressed region, and they were looking at making an investment decision to make an investment in a water efficiency technology. When they looked at just the straight kind of ROI, it didn't meet their internal rate of return. And so initially it sort of said, well, you know, this is not something we can invest in. But when you start to kind of unpack and look at a rosy way of approaching it, you might say, okay, we're, you, they then started to explore, well, we're in a water stress region and there were X number of days in the last year, two years, three years, et cetera, where we had to shut down operations because there wasn't enough water for us to run our plant. Then you might look at those supply chain disruptions and you can really sort of on, on them begin to think, well, what did that cost us in terms of revenue loss? Um, you know, furloughed employees, did we face fines or any reputational repercussions because of this, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a very one example at a more um, micro lens, but when you start to actually decompose a lot of different types of benefits, then when you look at sort of, well, this investment now in this technology is going to have avoided costs and help me save on future risks that may occur in my operations in the future, you begin to be able to present a business case in a different way. So I think it's the accounting tools, the frameworks, the data systems that enable a company to be able to look at these investments in that type of manner. That's what I think is, is more of the, the kind of white space now. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up um, 
first of all, the inclusive measures and being able to use those inclusive inclusive measures that may not have initially accounted for something like the the water uh, the water question and investment in the water technology for its returns. Um, that you start to look at other measures, and it particularly seems to overlap with this question of the presumed. Uh, relationship to climate change in the future. I mean, you take something like a water water starved region or um, water stressed region, and I've written about this with my colleague who's actually on the call today, Musa, um, about you know who lives in one of those uh, very much a water uh, stressed region where they have a clear view, I think, in those regions of what the future holds for them and being able to build that risk into the, in the current analysis so they see the internal rate of return being very different because of that future uh, that they see. And I think it goes into our second question that we talked about, which is you profiled, and we'll point people to those resources too towards the end, you profiled in your work on the apparel industry, specifically a couple of companies that I think it was clear with REI and Eileen Fisher they would do this even if the quantitative measures didn't necessarily make the internal rate of return argument. Uh, they were doing it well in advance, you know, REI particular, and Eileen Fisher, both of them have long histories of doing this kind of work uh, and without necessarily knowing how to quantify or being able to quantify all of the value. So I'm curious, uh, do you, has, is your experience at the center different in working with what I would call kind of purpose-driven or purpose-led companies and how they understand these me the metrics and the um, the framework and the data that you're able to create with Rosie, and the not the ones who are not necessarily purpose led but have sustainability goals and how they use that data. Yeah, so I actually, you know, from the various types of companies that we've worked with, um, I'm not sure that we do see a really stark difference there because I think that even the companies, as you noted, who have been doing this work for a lot longer, it's more core to their DNA. And even companies who you know, have made sustainability commitments, but it's maybe not the first thing you think of when you think of their brand, I think they still face these similar challenges. And I think the challenge across all of them is, I mean, it's not very sexy, but it's data. And it's getting the data out of the organization, be they small companies, large companies. And part of that, I think, is just the nature of sustainability work. So some of it is the costs and benefits of a sustainability initiative might live in different parts of the organization. So in a company that's more purpose oriented and more kind of everyone understands this off the bat, you know, a project engagement to get very in the weeds might move a little faster because everyone kind of knows why you're doing it. You have to do less of that sort of socialization, if you will. Whereas in a bigger company where maybe it's not as core, you have you know, a lot of the project and rosy work is building for an understanding of kind of why are you asking me for that data point? How does this connect? I don't really understand it. Um, but but I think that that fundamentally these tools for tracking this work doesn't really exist um, or, or it doesn't exist in a very robust or easy to roll out kind of um, way. So I think that where differences may occur might be also like what you're exploring, you know, with our REI case, they wanted us to monetize and look at the business case for being that purpose oriented organization and how it translated to employee oriented outcomes. Um, you know, and that that maybe isn't something they and, and I think in that case, one notable example was in our monetization efforts, we started by analyzing their employee engagement survey data, where they asked particular questions about the company's purpose orientation, sustainability commitments, just to name a few. So that's an example where the company, because of their orientation and commitment to this work, I, in my view, is already more progressive in the ways that they're trying to track that feedback and get it from their employees. If I wanted to go to another organization and say, okay, I wanna apply exactly what I did to REI to your organization, I may have to first start by saying, you need to be asking questions in your employee engagement survey that allow us to analyze that data. So that's kind of one difference that I see is sort of sometimes you have to go a couple of steps back and say, you need to be setting up the right ways to track this information to then be able to actually build a model to understand the ROI as well. 
Yeah, that's a that's an important differentiation because when I initially approached Rosie, the Rosie work, I assumed because it was a framework that it was a standardized framework. And yet what I began to appreciate when I started to read through the case studies of all the organizations you were working with is that they need to be responsive to the organizational context that you're working in and particularly the data sources that they have been able to collect historically. So as you're saying, an organization that has those kind of employee pulse surveys, they can pull some of the cultural vectors uh, and purpose that is driving the employees is gives you a different analysis points than the companies that haven't yet incorporated that data. So, you know, those obviously the companies that you're working with benefit from being able to understand the types of data they should be collecting in the future, as well as being able to find, you know, look across the organization to figure out what kind of data they can collect. And I think that's one of the things that I want to um, build on, which is you talk in your writing um, uh, about the journey and this ju this internal journey and maybe even the differentiation, which you said there's not a lot of differentiation between the purpose-led companies and those that are not. I think that my experience is that in organizations that have this kind of purpose-based unity around sustainability goals, it is, it is acculturated to the extent that they understand why this data is being collected and they kind of see the bigger picture. I'm curious for you to talk about a little bit about that journey because it seemed like you were suggesting that the journey for collecting the data for an organization was as important, if not more important than the findings and the, and the sharing of the findings that come out of the ROSI analysis. So can you talk a little bit about the, the data journey and the kind of interpersonal journey, I guess, but inside of organizations as they're going through this, what seems like a, some t in some cases, a multi-year process of data collection. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I just want to um, comment on one thing that um, is that you're absolutely right in our work with Rosie to date in the last three years or so, which is really kind of as long as we've been um, kind of building out this methodology. The work is a little more kind of custom to the company, but everything we do, the tools, they're all up on our website as, as, a, as an academic institution, you know, needs to have a public facing component of it. I think one of our aspirations is that these that we find ways to standardize them and so that you know how might this be incorporated into a financial management system right we're not there yet um but it certainly i think is something where we hope that you know it's i don't know five years from now or something is there a core rosy metric that every company is reporting on and our investors demanding a rosy metric as well um, so welcome feedback thoughts partnership and how to um, get there but just to say that is kind of a direction that we're um, um, moving towards so to, to, the, to the question you just asked adam you know prior to coming to stern i worked at bsr one of the leading corporate sustainability consulting firms and so in that work i had a lot of experience working with companies on materiality and designing and you know running through materiality strategy um, processes i bring that up because i think you know that's also really a core input into sustainability strategy setting um, goals and targets as well. And I think the materiality is often, you know, it's a fundamental process in defining focus for a company and what they should be prioritizing. Um, but it also, in my experience from doing that work, was really a way that our client, generally a sustainability lead at a company, was socializing this work within the organization. And so that's another example parallel where Certainly the production of the materiality matrix or whatever the outputs were is very important, but equally important is that like, then you have to go do the work with your colleagues. And so, you know, having them kind of be on the team and have co-created and built it is a very important part of that work as well. So with, with Rosie, you know, our work with companies can start at a lot of different levels. Oftentimes it may be saying, what are all the different things you want to explore and mapping the different practices that are actually, they're actually implementing to address the strategy and understanding what's business as usual, what's changed because of your sustainability work, and then doing a lot of interviews to understand what, what, what is it, what's the gist of, 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 of what you're um, working on here. And then it's building models and getting data and getting validation. A key stakeholder in all of these partners is someone from the finance team, because we want to ensure that we're building a tool that passes muster with them. Because if you have a sustainability person building a finance tool, even if they're 
a CFA and an MBA, you know, if they're not in finance, right, depending on how your corporate culture works, it may not, you know, sort of be seen as a valid and credible tool. So the, the point I, that I, I've, I've, I've made around this is I think that, you know, building the tool and getting to the NPV or the ROI, getting to the number is really important because it's real data. It's from the company. There's assumptions, but all financial modeling has some kind of assumptions in it. But it's also that the, the work of training others within an organization that this is data that's worthy of being collected and it's worthy of being aggregated. And you know, with REI, our, our contact there has said this before, I mean, it brought his team in sustainability and HR together. It's not that they never worked together, but they never worked together in this way. And so I think that's really valuable to these organizations as well, to begin to build these partnerships internally to then say, okay, you know, how might we think about our work with a little more rigor, a little more in a quantitative way and see where the linkages may be. That's great. And I, I was listening to um, somebody from London Stock Exchange talking about how historically a lot of the data that had been coming out had been coming through the marketing, through a marketing organization or maybe within a sustainability team and reporting and call in uh, making a call for a very something very similar to what you suggest, which is that finance needs to be integral to this process going forward. And certainly from an investment landscape, I know that they're looking for greater kind of rigor behind the behind the quantitative analysis and data that goes into it. And there, but there's also the engagement function with finance that you're talking about that is really integral. So there's both the kind of cultural piece as well as the the integrity of the data and and being able to have much better data, which it seems like from it from the the asset holder standpoint, that's what they're looking for and seeing a real lack of now, which builds into a, we're going to run out of time. Uh, I'm going to ask the last question, which is a very big question, which is, it seems like there's, uh, there's a lot of conversation about the, whether the current metrics that are being used for ESG reporting are sufficient or insufficient towards creating both the kind of the, the environmental, social and governance impact that we need to see in the world, given the escalating importance of uh, sustainability and climate, climate change specifically. And, and so, uh, and then the, the other piece is whether they're actually measuring all of the things that we need to be measuring within an ESG landscape. And is there, I'm curious from your work, are you seeing that there's a kind of need for what would be an ESG 2.0? And I realize that there's, there's standards organizations, uh, SASB and a number of other organizations that are working to try to figure out what this new set of standards are. And there's lots of different organizations, even internally. And we're in conversation with a few of those too, who are trying to figure out their own, you know, what is this balance between our own metrics as asset, uh, as asset holders in, in analyzing our portfolio and working within a, st a standardized system globally. So I'm curious from your perspective, do you, do you think that what we look at is kind of standardized ESG measures are insufficient to the task from both an impact as well as a as well as a um, quantitative measurement standpoint, and how do you see uh, that evolving, particularly in the context of a call for as we move from sustainability to regenerative? Big question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like we, we could have a you know three hour um, talk about that. So I'll I'll, I'll share some some views. So. Uh, Yes, I think we are moving towards a state where ES, I think the I think ESG data is getting better, um, but I think it's still it still has a, a a long ways to go. I think the signs of integration and harmonization and pending you know mandatory disclosures from the SEC of the U.S. context. There's a lot of pending regulation in um, Europe as well. You know, I think that there there are signs that that there will be a move towards some set of standardized disclosure, which I think is a good thing. Um, I had a ESG expert and investor um, on, in my undergrad class as a guest speaker yesterday, and I'm going to kind of parrot a lot of what she said because I think it, it really is spot on. You know, I think when investors in general are looking at a company, they're buying a couple different ESG data provider sets. They're engaging and asking their own questions, and they're doing their own kind of analysis. 
um, which I think isn't going to change. Um, you know, even if I, even in just looking at financial metrics, people are reading the mandatory disclosures, but they're also doing engagement, their own research on the side, and their own type of thesis and um, sort of um, bringing their own spin to it as well. I think what's 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 missing is I think and again you know what 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 I I think what 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 she shared in my class really resonates is that they're looking for companies to have a clear focus rooted in materiality be that from SASB or a robust materiality assessment I think that's that's crucial um, clear goals and targets and what she continually said which I love was I need a denominator. You know, I, I need to understand the context of what you're reporting. And I think that even though there's increasing, you know, I think SASB is great, but I think that we would say SASB doesn't connect it to the financial metrics in return. And we actually have a piece coming out in collaboration with them in a couple of weeks where we're mapping some work we did in automotive around performance on these disclosures as, as put forth by SASB, where we found drivers of financial performance as well. So, you know, I, I think that um, I think also to your other question, which I know a lot of people have been talking about with a couple recent pieces out there around sort of, you know, kind of sustainability for sustainability sake or reporting for reporting sake. And I agree with that. Um, you know, I got GRI certified years ago and kind of in the middle of the session, I said, but once you do all this, who's doing the strategy and implementation work? You know, when do you have time to do that work? It just seems very cumbersome and a lot of work. I'm all for transparency and disclosure, but I think that companies need to do it in a more streamlined way. Um, and with limited resources, do you need full headcount just focused on reporting and disclosure? Um, maybe you need one person in a large organization, but I think the work that has to get done is we need to figure out how to implement and we need to figure out how to meet these goals and targets. Yes, be transparent. Yes, make the business case. But I think that um, just reporting and just disclosing is limiting companies' abilities to actually do the work. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done and 2030 is nine years away. So um, hope I got to some of your large, um, you know, question, Adam. It's great. Uh, yeah, as we said, we could go on about this for hours. So, but the intention is here to open up conversations and dialogue amongst everybody uh, on this call. So I'd like to, we're gonna move into breakouts now. Thank everyone for coming today. It was a pleasure being with you all and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.